Good evening and welcome to this special programme live from the headquarters of the Avon and Somerset Force. Tonight we investigate if our towns and cities are safe as cuts to the police deepen. We're on the front line as police warn crime is going undetected. We are actually stretched, stretched to breaking point, purely and simply because sometimes it, take, it may take us 24 hours, 48 hours to get to see a victim of crime. There is just not enough of us. It is, you know, in, in my mind anyway, it's simple. There are not enough police officers on the street. I'll be with the Chief Constable live in a police car to find out whether he believes the public is protected. I'll be with the team responding to your emergency calls to find out how difficult it is to get to each urgent crime. Plus how criminals exploit our rural communities because there are fewer officers than in urban areas. Sometimes it's just one or two of us and travelling criminals see an area that is less policed and see that as an opportunity. And the little boy who became a cop for a day and the officer who made it all happen. Good evening. You join me live here at the control room in Portishead for Avon and Somerset Police. Now, the team you can see around me are responding to 999 calls tonight as we speak. Now, this evening, we dedicate our whole program to policing and the effects of budget cuts on the force. Tonight, my colleague Victoria Davis will be here in this control room monitoring the 999 calls coming in. Now, with officers claiming the force is at breaking point, I'll be putting those concerns live to the Chief Constable as we travel to the force's operations centre in Clevedon. And Karen Bell will be live in Bridgewater, looking at how the small team of police there try to keep our Somerset countryside free from crime. Now, I'm now heading to Cleve Clevedon in that police car with the Chief Constable. But first, my colleague Richard Payne has been out on the front line with police officers in Bristol, looking at the day and night of their tasks. Now, we couldn't have imagined just how dramatic that night would be. She's got a, a male who's got a stab wound to his knee and thigh. 6 p.m. Saturday night and the emergencies have already begun. Amid unsuspecting shoppers, a man has been attacked with a knife. It's shocking to all except for the police on scene. This is a, a park that is increasingly coming to light for all of the wrong reasons. Knife point robberies, stabbings, other sort of violent offences, antisocial behaviour, drug taking. Castle Park is really a hot spot. The response is impressive. Some 20 officers will either gather evidence, interview the victim in hospital, or search for his attackers. But this incident is heavy on resources. There will be other emergencies that are unresourced at the moment, whether that be on our patch or other areas around, around the city. That are going unresourced, people have been waiting hours to see a police officer. Just, there is just not enough of us. Um, and criminality and that sort of stuff around the city goes, um, Undetected almost, yeah. And it's those undetected crimes leading many to now question their role in the job. This suspected failure to stop, unrelated to the previous incident, was one of 40 calls from the public asking for a police response at the same time. Sometimes that figure runs into the hundreds. And minutes after the first knife attack comes reports of another incident involving a blade. A gang of boys have run into a department store one allegedly produced this knife and assaulted a security guard. He's 13 years old and is detained by police. Can't arrest me for a two-inch blade. Hey! He is arrested on suspicion of carrying a blade and common assault. It means a trip to a centre out of town where the majority of cases are now dealt with in Bristol, following the closure of several police stations and their cells. Valuable time taken away from the streets. At this stage, I'm not asking for any uh, comment about it or whether you agree or disagree with the offence. Would you understand the allegation against you? The desk sergeant decides to continue investigations not here, but at home, where our two officers will take him. The suspect has not been charged. Frustrations felt on the front line are not confined to it. The inspector at this Bristol police station has two sergeants, 18 PCs and four volunteer specials to cover the east of the city. 
He tells me resources are so stretched, some crimes previously attended are now restricted to a phone call. The amount of offenders we actually bring to justice has actually reduced, um, so it is actually quite disappointing because it doesn't give people closure. Um, quite often the victims of crimes around and say they like to have some form of closure to know what's actually happened, which we're unable to give now. How would you assess the police service at the moment? Is, is, it, is it fit for purpose? Is it, is it stretched to, to breaking point? I would say we are actually stretched stretch to breaking point purely and simply because sometimes it, take, it may take us 24 hours, 48 hours to get to see a victim of crime, which is never a case it should be. But such breakdowns in its valued bonds with the public is what worries many in the police and leads some to question the future of their force. And you'll see the uh, daytime report from Richard Payne in a few minutes' time. Well, as you can see, we're in the police car now. We are heading to Clevedon. We're being driven very competently by Jason in the front seat there. Um, now, I have to say this is the first time we've ever broadcast live from a police car, so please forgive us as sometimes the signal is a little bit patchy. Uh, next to me is the most senior police officer in the force. It's Andy Marsh. Uh, Andy, thanks very much for joining me. We heard from a, a, one of your officers there saying that the force is at breaking point. Is it at breaking point tonight? So since 2010, we've taken over £70 million out of our budget. That's nearly 30%. And we've seen a doubling of our serious and complex crime. So we've had to make some very big changes. We said we were at a tipping point uh, the autumn before last. So something has got to change with funding. Otherwise, policing will need to change dramatically. The Home Office, though, say that in 2019 to 20, the funding settlement will be the biggest increase since 2010. So you're going to be OK, are you, according to them? It's not going to be OK, but it is much needed. And it is, of course, subject to the approval of the Police and Crime Commissioner and the Police and Crime Panel. So that is yet to be determined. Many people watching this will be working in industries that have face cuts, you know, all sorts of public services, but also smaller businesses too. They'll be thinking, well, lots, lots of places are facing cuts. Why are the police moaning about this? Uh, we're not moaning and we're expressing what's happened. These are massive cuts, about 30% we've seen. Um, but we've also seen a doubling of the demand as expected of us, the serious and complicated demand. Now, what we're saying is we care deeply about the service we provide the public. We want to keep them safe. And so if we're to do that, we do believe we need the resources to do the job. OK, Andy, for now, thank you. Now, Avon and Somerset Police receive almost a quarter of a million 999 calls every year. Victoria Davis is back in Porter's Head, where we started the programme. Victoria, is it looking like a busy night there? It certainly is. To give you an idea of how busy things are here in the control room tonight, they've dealt with more than 1,500 calls today. 400 of those have been 999 calls, and they're currently there's 300 live incidents. And I've actually just witnessed on CCTV a group of youths being detained by police officers as suspected carrying knives. Well, to tell us more about the type of calls we're receiving here this evening is Becky Tipper, who is the manager. Hi. Becky, tell me what sort of calls we've had so far. Um, we've had lots of calls today. We've had people people in really serious mental health crisis at the lowest time of their life uh, needing our support. Um, two incidents of loose animals in the road. We've had a loose goat today. Um, we also had a really lovely call from another part of the country where, that saw our appeal about an elderly female who'd been really badly beaten up recently um, in our force area. Their um, great aunt had suffered a, uh, a similar offence um, and unfortunately hadn't survived and they wanted to send family um, flowers to the victim's family. Which so it's really varied but I know today is quite a steady night but when it's really really busy and you get those big incidents, how much pressure does that put on staff here? Um, there is a, always a lot of pressure but they're an incredibly professional team. Um, I'd love to be able to say to you that as the calls come in we have enough police resources to go to those incidents but that's not the case, we have to prioritise so the call handlers do a, a fantastic job of being able to prioritise those calls so that our uh, dispatch team can then get out the police resources to the people that need us most in the first instance. But you'd certainly like to see more resources here wouldn't you? Always. Okay, thank you very much Becky. Well we will be monitoring the calls throughout the evening while we're live but for now let's rejoin Kai who's in a police car heading to Clevedon. I am indeed, Victoria. Thank you very much. And moving quite smoothly at the moment. More from the Chief Constable in a moment. But first, just how much does it cost to run a police force? Here's a bit of a breakdown. The force's total budget is £284 million a year. That's a cost of £32,500 an hour. 
There are 2,651 officers, each requiring almost £2,000 of equipment, ranging from uniforms to body-worn cameras. Four and a half million pounds is spent every year on police vehicles, with almost two million of that on fuel alone. In the last three years, overall crime has increased by over a quarter. However, justice for victims has fallen, so now only one in every eight see their investigation concluded. Violent crime has nearly doubled in that time, as has the number of people arrested for possessing knives and other weapons. We simplified things a little bit there, Andy. I'm guessing you can't explain the budget of the force in about 40 seconds, okay. but we tried. Okay. Um, okay. Violent crime, as I said there, increased by 50%. That's shocking, isn't it? Are, so, are people safe watching this? So we recorded last year 40,000 violent crimes from the most serious, and last Thursday we saw an awful crime in the news. An 88-year-old woman battered and robbed. We've arrested someone. Um, they range right through to a whole range of uh, crimes, significantly around young people. Knife crime is the crime that's increased by over 50%. Now, of course, with that amount of violence around, it's impossible for me to say, of course, people are safe. But actually, so crime's very rare, but we want to do more. And if a budget increase is approved next year, we will focus on violent crime and drugs-related crime. OK, Andy, thank you. Now, earlier we saw Richard Payne's report at night with officers on the front line. Now, let's take a look at what happened when he went out with officers in and around Bristol during the day. Police know their visibility is the single biggest issue for the public, which is why exercises like this one in Bath are a deliberate tactic to tackle not so much criminality, but the fear of it. In 16 years, this sergeant says her workload has never been greater. How many times a day do you hear from the public, why aren't there more of you on the street? Yeah, I think if I had a, a pound for every time I heard that, I, I probably wouldn't need to work anymore. So, uh, yeah, it is. And, and it's not through a want of um, not wanting to be there for the public, because we do. We want to go out, we want to catch criminals, we want to stop burglaries, we want to keep the public safe um, and we get just as frustrated as them when we can't be there on time. But would that public be prepared to pay more for their police? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's how it, how it should be, shouldn't it? But um, yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, false choices we're given based around public spending. We pay enough, really, and we're not getting enough for what we do pay, personally. I would like to pay a bit more and see more police. I think it would be a good thing to have a lot more police around, though, whatever the cost, really, because it's safety at the end of the day. And in these kind of times, you kind of want safety. Something at the forefront of the minds of all officers, whether on the streets of Bath or the runway at Bristol Airport. This is where the terrorist threat is at its highest, and the monitoring of the passengers and their property has grown, along with the airport's own expansion. We are mainly checking staff this side. Um, staff would be what we call our insider threat. So they're inside the airport, they've got access to areas that the public don't. Um, and if anybody wanted to do something criminal from within the airport, then the staff would be the ones in the, in, in, have the ability to do that. Away from the city centre, these officers are not remote from the stresses of the job and are equally candid in how they now perceive it. There's no end to it. So, yeah, absolutely, 100%. I've questioned whether I want to carry on doing this. At the moment, I do. But there's been a lot of times when I haven't. We need extra funding. Um, I, I don't think we can beat around the bush anymore. I think the police force is struggling to cope. I think all forces across the country are struggling to cope. And I think if they want the police to continue in, in the, the fashion that they want, we need the extra funding. And those are the fundamental questions. What police force do we want and how much are we prepared to pay for it? Yeah, indeed, and I'll be putting some of those comments to the Police and Crime Commissioner in a moment. Andy, just finally from you, we heard one officer saying that he's thinking about leaving the force. Are you worried about the mental health of your officers if they're under a lot of, a lot of pressure? So my officers and staff care passionately about what they do. They don't do it for the money, and the work is full on. So today I've learned about a case where one of my detectives brought a rapist from 1983 to justice only a couple of years ago. The victim just thanked them 
but a lifetime of dealing with that sort of horrible crime has sadly broken the officer concerned. So I do worry about this, which is why we're putting a huge effort into caring for our officers and staff. And if, if we do that, then I've every expectation they will care for victims of crime. OK, Andy Marsh, thank you very much. Uh, well, let's go to uh, Westminster now. Our political correspondent, David Wood, is there live for us. Uh, David, what's the government's stance on police funding? Tonight, Kylie, ministers are insisting that they are on the front foot in engaging with police officers and recognise the changing demands that are being placed on them. A new funding settlement for the next financial year will see nearly an extra billion pounds available to the police. And I've had a statement tonight from the Home Office relating to the Avon and Somerset force, and it says that its funding will increase to £302.9 million next year if the Police and Crime Commissioner increases council tax precepts by £2 a month. This settlement will help provide additional money for recruitment and neighbourhood policing, counter-terrorism and fighting serious organised crime. That's the view from the Home Office on Avon and Somerset. Let's now hear from two senior, uh, two senior people from two of our other police forces. We've, we're doing well, we're, we're, we're meeting the standards but we can't continue to do that and certainly over this last year with the incidents in Wiltshire that have been you know, of, of world proportions, uh, our staff are pretty ragged after that and we do need to to increase the number of, of men and women in the front line of policing. The force has been incredibly resilient. Um, that doesn't mean to say that there aren't stresses, there are pressures, but financially we, we are sound. But I am also aware the Chief Constable doesn't have sufficient funds to deliver all the things that are required of him and all the things the public would like to see. As for the Dorset Force, the Chief Constable says the funding increase is better than expected, but the force will still only be able to provide the most basic of care. Of course, as a former Home Secretary, this is an area Theresa May comes under a great deal of pressure. She points to extra funding under the Conservatives, but also new rules for the police, extra powers against serious organised crime and violent crime, something, Kylie, we were hearing just a few moments ago is increasing in the Avon and Somerset area. That's right, David. OK, thank you very much. Um, now, we've almost arrived at our destination just outside Clevedon. Of course, Avon and Somerset court covers a massive area. It's not just the towns and cities, but the villages too. Uh, Karen Bell's in Bridgewater for us tonight. Karen, take us through the role of uh, rural officers. Well, first of all, Kylie, behind me is the force's second largest police station. And across the force area, around 700 members of the public use their local police station every day. And yet, even so, some of the smaller rural ones, Ilminster, for example, have shut down because of budget cuts. Others, like Froome, have been downgraded into inquiry kiosks, in Froome's case, in the local library. So the challenge for the rural teams is how do you cover very isolated communities with fewer police stations? And I've been spending time with officers in and around Exmoor to find out what their job's really like. It doesn't look like a crime hotspot, but this Exmoor pony breeding centre has had tools, quad bikes and sheep stolen, and the problems didn't stop there. Yeah, we've had some pretty nasty intimidations um, over the years with regard to the ponies, the Exmoor ponies. We've had people coming to deliberately let them out, uh, both out on the moor and out on the roads. Do you feel safe here in view of all that? Well, I do, but um, obviously if Dawn was here on her own, she would feel a little bit um, concerned. Yeah, I mean, when people deliberately come to do something nasty to your ponies that could result in them getting harmed, then you know, it does, does make you wonder what sort of person would do that. Nick and Dawn have now signed up to the police's farm watch scheme, under which farmers keep an eye out for each other, monitoring and reporting suspicious activity. It has made a difference, and, you know, people have remarked on it. Good. Helping the community to help itself is important round here because the local police have 400 square miles to keep an eye on. I hitched a lift with PC Sam Donati, who's used to covering a lot of ground. Rural officers are spread too thinly for his liking and can find it hard to get to places in time. At the moment, sometimes, it's just one or two of us and the proverbial needle in the haystack mm. problem comes to mm. mind. Criminals exploit vulnerability, and right. in particular tra travelling criminals see an area that is less policed and see that as an opportunity. As well as trying to cover the isolated areas, local towns like Minehead have familiar urban problems. Drugs, shoplifting, antisocial behaviour. 
but at least this is an area PC Sam can cover properly. He knows his beat and knows its troublemakers. Minehead is a small community um, and probably it's no more than about 20 or 30 people locally right. who are the ones who are committing the crime um, and who are causing us, us the problem. So it's on a smaller scale than the city, but nonetheless it's something that we've got to constantly keep an eye on. Down the road, PCSO Linda is on patrol in Dunster. She too appreciates the importance of knowing the area. We are actually there, the eyes near the community, so people can recognise us and come up and speak to us and, and give us information and things like that. Do you that. find that they, they'll approach you with yeah, tip about various yes, things? Yes, yeah. And yeah. we also use um, social media, so we have um, Facebook page, a work Facebook page and Twitter, so people nice. can contact us on there as well, which works really well. But for residents and business owners in Dunster, are there enough police around? I think you could always want more police, but I think the area is so vast that you're not going to have policing here all the time. And, you know, we do get a lot of visitors to Dunster with the castle. So I think it does warrant, to, we'll always want to have more police around, just, you know, because it does reassure us and the visitors. But more police will depend on more money in the budget. In the meantime, the challenge for Linda and Sam is seeing and being seen. It's striking to think just how large the Avon and Somerset force patch is. You've got the Quantix, the Mendips, most of Exmoor, a lot of driving for the officers involved. But, you know, perhaps driving in a police car has its own value. It might reassure members of the public and hopefully it might deter some criminals. Kylie. Karen Bell live in Bridgewater. Thank you very much. Well, as you can see, we've arrived at our destination just outside uh, Clevedon. This is the operations centre. Um, they have the mounted section here, as you'll see, and also the taser firing range. And joining me now is Sue Mount Stevens. Sue, thank you very much for joining us. Let's just go in and um, have a look at what they're doing here. So they're doing some training, aren't they? Yeah, fantastic. Um, I mean, you know, we're really blessed to have such great horses. And, you know, any officer will tell you that a horse is worth 10 officers when we've got public disorder. So they are in invaluable. You are the Police and Crime Commissioner. It's your job to make sure that the force is effective. We've been hearing lots of comments from police officers tonight, some saying that the force is at breaking point, other officers saying they want to leave. Are you doing your job effectively? I think what I can, I, you know, the officers will tell you that they are frustrated that there's not more of them. The public will tell you that they are frustrated. And one of the real issues and one of the bill benefits now that if I can get the increase of the council tax uh, precept through the uh, panel, it's subject to them, mm. their approval, that we will be able to take on a 100 additional officers. We've not been able to do that for a decade. We've had a decade of austerity. And with that increase, we will have 100 additional officers tackling the issues that local people tell mm. me. So burglary, drugs, knife crime. But where are we with that? Because the consultation ended on Monday. It could be two pounds, couldn't it, extra for the average uh, property. Is that actually going to happen? Uh, well, again, it's, I have to in, go in front of the uh, police and crime panel February the 5th, and I will argue that we really need that extra money. And listening to your packages, you'll see that we need that money across the whole of Avon and Somerset. We've heard from um, some people in the town where the HQ is based, just where I came from, in Portishead, with, with one man saying that he's thinking about starting his, his own kind of evening patrols um, to, to monitor crime. Let's just have a listen to what he had to say. So my plan is to um, spend a couple of nights um, video blogging for the public and just literally highlighting what activity there is, what concerns there are, what police presence, if any, that are in the town, basically just to highlight suspicious activity at night, just to give a bit of peace of mind really to the public. What's your response to that then? He wants peace of mind for the public. So do I and so does the Chief Constable. There was a spike at the end of last year in, in Portishead um, and those numbers have come down. We have about an average of eight offences uh, a, a month in Portishead. But the whole, the whole point is, is that we've got to stop being 
uh, reactive. Mm. We've got to do much more proactivity. And with this additional money, with the council tax precept, we will do much more disruption and people will be able to see a, a vast difference in the police. Very, very briefly, Sue, did you ever imagine that this job that you've taken on would be this hard? No, never. Um, I didn't think that I was going to always be having to look at a spreadsheet and work out how to do a balanced mm. budget. But, you know, we said with the Chief Constable that we were at the tipping point and the government have now heard that and they are saying to local residents that they now have to uh, see if we can, they, they will pay for, to get the police service that Avon and Somerset deserve. Okay, Sue Ant Stevens, thank you very much. Um, let's just go back to Victoria, who's at the headquarters um, in Porter's Head in the control room. Victoria, how's it looking there this evening? Well, since we've been on air, we've had 30 extra calls from people, all wanting police assistance. Well, to give us an idea of what's happening this evening, let's rejoin Becky. Becky, tell us what we're dealing with at the moment. Well, we've had quite a lot of happened uh, since we were last on air. We've got a, a burglary just coming in now. Someone's disturbed a male in their home. Uh, we've got some youths, uh, some young people out and about in the road, um, causing um, running around. We've nearly been hit by a vehicle. We've got a young um, child left out on their own. We're just going to check them out as well. So there's a lot going Going on. So it's really varied and this is part of the pressure isn't it because you never know what's, what the call's going to be, you never know when it's going to be that life or death situation. You absolutely don't and it can vary so much so we just have to be ready to deal with that next call and make sure we've got a police resource to go out to those who need us. Do you ever worry though that you're not getting to people in time so I know the response times have got longer? Um, I think with the types, you know, we've had a lot of knife crime in the force area as well and as well as nationally so these, these crimes, you know, they take a lot of police resource to go to but we will always prioritise those who need us most to make sure we're there. Okay, Becky, thank you. Okay, let time now to rejoin Kylie in Clevedon. OK, Victoria, thank you very much. Now, as we've been hearing tonight, uh, the police are very much hand to mouth, but there are some times where they can afford to go the extra mile. They did that here at the mounted section. Um, my colleague Lucy McDade has caught up with one little boy, Jaden, who became a cop for a day. When you want to grow up to be a policeman, there aren't many better days than this. Jaden Tomlinson Parker got to be a cop for a day. It was before he had a heart transplant for a rare condition. But now, as Jaden gets better, his family say it's a day he'll never forget. It was a dream to Jaden to become a police officer. And again, we'll go back to saying, you know, we, I, we didn't know if Jaden was going to get his transplant and memories, and the chances were very, very small. So to see him, his dream come true in the day of a memory was amazing. It was all thanks to this man, PC Secker, who made it happen. They feel it's a drop in the ocean. It was a little bit, made a little boy smile, and that's what he'll say to you, because he, you know, but it's not, it's more than that. Um, and I don't know how many times I've got to tell him it's more than that, Ad. You saved this family. You made us believe that people did care. Ad is now retiring after nearly three decades in the force, and meeting Jaden was a highlight. But he's such a lovely, engaging, endearing little boy, and... I thought, you know, this is an easy thing for us to do. Let's make this kid's dream come true because it, without that heart transplant, he might not get another opportunity to do it. And Adger's work throughout his career hasn't gone unnoticed. He's just been awarded a British Empire medal. So this is a lovely way to end my career. And it's, uh, it, it was very humbling and, and, and I'm honoured. Look at Adger. Adger's very tall. Even Jaden's toys are now named after PC Secker. And when he grows up, he wants to be just like him. Lucy McDade, ITV News. Well, good luck to Adj and to Jade. And well, that's all from us on this special programme. The weather forecast is coming up next. But for all of us here, have a lovely evening. Goodbye.